So I was listening to the Lex Friedman podcast where he talks to Elon Musk and they started talking about Grok, which is Elon Musk's version of ChatGPT. Basically, it's what ChatGPT should have been. And as they were talking about this, Elon said this. The internet at this point is polluted with so much AI generated data. It's insane. If you want to search the internet, you can say Google exclude anything after 2023. <laughs> it will actually often give you better results. Yeah. Um, because there's this so much, the, the explosion of, of AI generated material is uh, crazy. So like in, in training Grok, um, we actually have to have sort of apply AI to the data to say, is this data most likely correct or most likely not before we feed it into the training system. That's crazy. And that is crazy. But it also made me think, how does this actually work? I do understand somewhat how large language models learn from data, but how? Like, how do you get it from the internet? What is even the internet? It's such an abstract concept. How do you download the internet? And the answer to this question turned out to be way more interesting than I thought, because it also unlocks the key to understanding how most of the internet works. Specifically, how search engines like Google works. And the answer is web crawlers. And so to understand web crawlers, Google is actually a really good place to start. Because to me, Google has somewhat become synonymous with the internet. When I think of the internet, I think of Google. There's almost a subconscious misconception in my mind where I see Google and I see an equal science between Google and the internet. They're the same thing in my subconscious mind. I know that's not the case, but that's how it feels. So at least for me, it's kind of easy to forget that Google is actually just a website. It's a website used to find other websites. But the question is then, how does Google actually know where those websites are? Because those websites would still exist even if Google didn't exist. So they're actually completely independent of Google. And the answer to that is, like I said before, through web crawlers. So if like me, you've heard about web crawlers, but you never really knew what they were, then it's actually relatively simple. And the essential part of it is just that it's a program that goes to a specific URL and then it downloads that page of that URL. And then it looks for other links within that page. And then it just goes to all those links and downloads those pages, looks for links within those pages and downloads that and just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going until it doesn't find any more links. And this is how Google then knows what websites exist. They just have web crawlers running around looking for new links and new pages that pop up. And Google is then essentially just a database of all the web pages that exist on the internet. And then they basically index and rank those pages, which is an entire video on its own, how that all works. But that's the essential process for how a search engine works. And the same web crawling technique is what is then used to train LLMs. And if you're a programmer, then a basic web crawler could be essentially a while loop. While there are more hyperlinks within a page, keep going to those pages and downloading them. And that is how you download the internet. The only problem is, like Elon mentioned, if we want to train an LLM to give us accurate and truthful responses, then downloading the internet is only the first step. The most difficult problem to solve is actually the filtering problem. I mean, the entire internet is not full of high quality, good information. There might be false information out there. So if we train our LLM on this false information, then there's a relatively high probability that it will actually give us this false information as a response if we ask it questions. And there can even be websites out there that are just like parody math sites that give out wrong answers to math questions. So this is the bulk of the work when it comes to training LLMs because they use such huge data sets to train on that the unfiltered data set is even bigger, of course. And it first has to go through just the basic sorting of like removing duplicates, for instance, removing non-textual data like images or code snippets or video metadata. And then we have to look through and find things like spam, things that are completely irrelevant for the, the model that we want to train. And if this filter is of low quality, then the LLM will be of low quality. And today I think that the filter of these LLMs is actually the biggest or most impactful differentiator between LLMs. And Elon shared what I thought was just such a cool solution to the filtering problem. It's not unique to Elon, it's not something that he came up with obviously, but they actually use an LLM to filter the data 
before they feed it into the training set for the actual LLM or Grok as he calls it. And this is where we get into some of the most interesting questions regarding these LLMs, which is where we go from quantifiable to qualitative metrics in a lot of ways, like the definition of what is good information versus what is bad information. That is actually a qualitative challenge because it very much depends on how do you define something that's good or something that's bad. Because there are questions in this world that are quite nuanced where there isn't a clear right or wrong answer and there might not even be a right or a wrong answer. And in those cases, the values and the priorities of the humans who actually build or train these LLMs or make these decisions have major impact on the outcome. And there's a really interesting example here, which is for self-driving cars, where let's say that there's a self-driving car going down the road and all of a sudden a pedestrian walks out in front of it. And now the car has to make the decision of either keep going straight and maintain the safety of the passenger, but kill the pedestrian or veer off to the side and hit a wall, a concrete wall or something and kill the passenger but maintain the safety of the pedestrian, who in that scenario deserves to die. That's a decision that the car literally has to make. It's an edge case, but it's something that's like a, an ethical dilemma, I guess. And those sort of questions or, or other questions that aren't as specific as that one are questions that come up when you are training these LLMs. You have to make decisions on how is this LLM going to act in these situations or what is right and what is wrong? If you made it this far into the video, then feel free to leave a comment like saying what you think the right answer to that question is, because I'd be genuinely interested in seeing what you guys think of it. I've tried to flip that question back and forth so many different ways because it's just such an interesting ethical dilemma in my opinion. And this is where I think or hope that Elon might be the right man for the job. He at least seems to, from what I can tell, to adhere to sound principles in my mind, which are like free speech, truth, and first principle physics. And so when he says that they apply AI to first filter out the training data for the LLM that they're building or for Grok, I believe that what they're actually doing is they have several different LLMs. So they have maybe one that is spe specialized on first principle physics and then they have one that's specialized on like high quality text and then they have one that's specialized on truth and the data has to go through all of these LLMs first before it gets filtered into the actual LLM and this is called classifier based filtering and when I first heard this my first question was well how did they train the first model then? So the way that this could work is you'd start out smaller and then you'd build upwards. So you'd start out by just limiting your scope as much as possible. Let's say that we wanna build an LLM that can just understand if this is high quality text or if it's low quality text. Low quality text just being like, it's not very well written, let's say. What we could do then is we could decide that, well, Wikipedia tends to have relatively high quality text. It's not always trustworthy, but it has relatively high quality text. So we build a web crawler that goes to Wikipedia and it just downloads all the Wikipedia pages that are out there. What we could then do is we could apply this LLM, this really small one that was really quick and easy to train. We can apply that LLM to a bigger data set, which could be the entire internet. And then we could use that LLM to basically filter out good versus bad or low quality text. Now I'm not an LLM engineer, so this is not the best way to do this. This is just my crude way of explaining kind of the larger picture of how this generally kind of works. If you wanted to actually do this, you'd probably use more resources than just Wikipedia and you'd probably use a relatively large data set as well, but you'd limit it in some way. And this is also why creating a good LLM takes time because if you're starting from scratch, then you have to go through all these intermediary steps before you can create an LLM that is actually really good. But it also means that the rate of development once you have a good LLM becomes exponential because you can then just use your really good LLM to train your next LM and so on and so on. And that is how you download the internet and teach an LLM how to speak. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. I made this video because I was just curious myself of how some of these things work. I wanted to see if I could learn it myself or understand it enough to hopefully explain it in a really simple way to you. So I hope you got something out of it and uh, yeah, I hope I'll see you in the next one.